Okay, so good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Future of Low Carbon Dairy, which is the first in our Future of Milk Production webinar mini series. So my name is Cassie McCready. I'm the Business Development Manager for Livestock and Aquaculture at the Agri Epi Centre, and I am going to be your host for the webinar this afternoon. So um, we're delighted to have partnered with two of our members, Kings Hay and Zoetis, to bring you today's insightful webinar. So before we begin and get underway with introducing the speakers, I just wanted to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So please note that this session is being recorded. All attendees are on mute and in listen only mode. Questions will be taken at the end of the presentation and you can submit these at any time during the webinar via the questions bar on the GoToWebinar panel on the right hand side of your screen. So we would like to hear them from you throughout the presentation and do please also remember you can interact with us through the chat function. So today we're going to be welcoming David Pettit and Sarah Bolt from Kingshay, Jan van Dijk from Zoetis and Duncan Forbes from Agri Epicenter. So without further ado, I'd like to take the first few minutes of your time just to introduce Agri Epi to you all before hearing from our first speakers. So here we go, Agri Epicenter, as I said, Cassie McCready, Business Development Manager for Livestock and Agriculture, and my email address is below. So who are AgriEpi and where do we stand? So our position, AgriEpi Centre is one of four agri-tech centres in the UK. So we're supported via Innovate UK by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BASE, and we exist to deliver benefits to UK farming. So as you can see from the list below, we are the Agri Epi Centre. Epi is Engineering, Precision and Innovation. We have our three sister centres. The first is Agri Metrics. They are our big data centre of excellence. The second is CHAP, Crop Health and Protection. And the third is CL, the Centre for Innovation and Excellence in Livestock. So Agri Epi is centred around a membership offering. We have around 120 members at present, and we bring together academic institutions, industry partners, and government to design and develop research innovations to support agriculture. So our members include organisations not only from livestock sector, not only from the dairy sector, but from all the major agri-food sectors. That includes arable, horticulture, livestock and grassland, aquaculture, and cross-sector. So we work with various types of members, including those on the right, so academic institutions, biotech and digitech companies, engineering companies, farmers, industry bodies, NGOs, charities, processors, retailers and tech developers, so people vertically up and down the supply chain and laterally as well. So AgriEpi's purpose and concept, so we have three main objectives and they are to be a key player in ensuring that the UK grows its status as a world leader in precision agriculture, to operate a wide range of industry-led activities and projects and to ensure that any knowledge and new information that's generated through our work is translated and exchanged within the industry to the relevant audiences. So we think of ourselves as the agri-tech enabler. So we give um, a plethora of services to our members and these include access to leading academic institutions, brokering collaborations and building consortia, we have the facilities, as you'll hear later on in this presentation, to test and demonstrate new technologies. We help find, we help partners access and apply for funding for R&D. We provide business incubation facilities at our Midlands hub, and we have KE and dissemination, and we also influence policy. So just a little bit of a visual for you now to show you our network. On the left, you'll see a map of the UK. So the red dots are what we call our hubs, starting with the Northern Hub up in Edinburgh. Moving down into England, we've got our Midlands Hub, which is near Newport at Harper Adams University. This is where we host our business incubation facilities and we have the Midlands Dairy Research Centre there as well. Moving slightly down and east of the country, we have our Cranfield Hub, which is focused on the crop and arable side. And then moving further down the country and back to the west, we have our Southwest Dairy Development Centre that you're going to hear more about from my colleague Duncan later in this presentation based in Shepton Mallet. We also have, oh, sorry, we also have a number of satellite farms up and down the UK. So these are the white dots that you can see on the map on the left. So there's 24 satellite farms and they cover all the different agricultural sectors, so arable and livestock. We also have three international satellite farms in China, Paraguay and New Zealand. And all of these commercial farms in the UK and across the world act as 
commercial test beds so that technology developers can trial, demonstrate and validate their novel innovations for the agriculture sectors. So without further ado, I don't want to take any more of your time, but I will introduce Sarah and David from Kingsay. So Sarah is the membership development manager at Kingsay and she's worked in the agricultural sector for over 20 years, joining Kingsay in 2017. So Sarah is responsible for knowledge transfer within the organisation, principally writing technical publications and providing practical telephone advice to farmers. Her role with Kings Hay continues to build on her passion for motivating and inspiring change on farm for a profitable, profitable and sustainable future. We also welcome David Pettit. So David's been involved in farm management, dairy consultancy and farm training programmes for over 25 years. So this, this has included the management of five dairy farms over 2000 acres, the design, construction and establishment of the Southwest Dairy Centre at Shepton Mallet and supporting the work of Kings Hay with consultancy clients across the country. So David contributes to the Kings Hay technical notes and has a long interest in creating healthy soils. So we can see your screen, uh, Sarah and David, so off you go. Sorry, just unmute yourself. Sorry for any technical difficulties we were experiencing there. I'm hoping that you can now hear me. So as Cassie said, my name is Sarah Bolt and I'm responsible for all the technical information that is produced by Kings Hay. And I either write this myself or commission other experts to write the content for me. We have recently issued five publications um, looking at net zero emissions. Um, where we've identified the sources of each greenhouse gas and provided practical solutions on how emissions may be reduced. These publications were written by my colleague David Pettit, who will share with everyone today some of his findings. But just to set a little bit of context, climate change has been increasing at an alarming rate, particularly in the last 20 years, and agriculture accounts for 10% of all of those greenhouse gases produced in the EU. So in order to limit global warming to around one and a half degrees, globally, total greenhouse gas emissions need to be net zero by 2080. With this in mind, the UK government net zero for 2050. However, British farming led by the NFU have set even the more ambitious goal to achieve net zero 10 years earlier. So Dave, can you tell us more? taking perhaps each of the greenhouse gases in agriculture, what are the main sources of each? Um, thank you, Sarah. If, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Um, so I think as you, as you can see from, uh, from this pie chart, um, methane uh, on the right hand side accounts for around about 38 to 44 percent. This is enteric methane uh, from fermentation, rumen fermentation. Around about 38 to 44 percent of total uh, greenhouse gas contributions or CO2 equivalents. That's followed uh, by purchase feed, and, and within that figure, it also includes um, you know, the production, the distribution, processing, and also the uh, greenhouse gas that's created from burning of. Uh, rainforests for um, yeah, particularly soya and palm kernel. Um, the third largest contribution there is from manure management, uh, which is almost entirely down to on, on UK farms. Predominantly methane again and nitrous oxides. And then the 12% is generated by fertilizer 
Again, a lot of that is embedded in the fertilizer from, through the production and distribution, uh, but also then how, how we deal with that on, how we manage it on, on farms. Um, and interestingly, only 6% of the contribution is from the, the electricity and the fuel that we use on farm. Whereas you know, this, this is accounted for you know, a vast amount of the money that's been spent to reduce greenhouse gases. It represents only really a tiny, tiny fraction of, of what is created. Um, so if we can just go to the next, the next slide, please. Um, I just want to put the, the, the methane question to in some sort of context. On a farm level, you, you can see it, it contributes, particularly I'm talking um, enteric uh, fermentation here. On a farm level, it accounts for, for a high proportion of total greenhouse gases. But if you look on a global scale, um, you can see on the left hand side of this, of this graph, you've got the, in the, the two orange bars, which show, if you like, the human contribution of um, methane. You have a little bit of biomass burning um, and then another big chunk from wetlands and other natural um, emissions. This is largely, but not quite, balanced out by the sinks, which is on the right hand side. You know, methane only lasts in the atmosphere, um, has a half life of about 10 years. Um, and so, you know, there's some question that it might even be less than that. So the difference between the, the two, between the, the uh, production of methane and the um, you're getting rid of the methane is only about 10 gigatons, which is it's still a lot of methane, but it represents about 1.5 to 1.7 percent of total methane emissions. So to put that into a little bit more context, if we reduce on farm methane by about 10 percent, the whole global, you know, over the whole world, then the whole um, methane budget balances out. So although it's a high proportion of what come, uh, greenhouse gases that are um, emitted from farms, on a global scale, it's still a relatively doable target, I think, 10%. Um, Sarah, if we can go to the next, the next slide, please. So as you were saying there, that enteric methane is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously methane is a natural consequence of rumen fermentation. How can we influence this biological system? Yes, yeah, so th I think this, yeah, th it is a, a natural consequence of uh, rumentation. Um, it's created by a group of bacteria, methanogens. Um, and it's an energy demanding uh, process. So it reduces gross energy to, to the cows by between about two to 12%. So the lower the amount of rumen we, we can get the cows to produce, the more energy that goes into milk production. The, the factors that really affect the amount of rumen, um, first of all, I would say it is forage quality. So the higher the, or the, the lower the quality of the forage, the more lignin, the longer it takes to, to break down, the greater the amount of rumen that's uh, produced. The, so the, and, and the, the other factor I think is um, forages such as, as clover, they have an, um, condensed tanning, high levels of condensed tanning, they have low or high solubility, high degradabilities, are better, you know, produce less rumen than um, grasses, straw, hay, uh, these sort of products, uh, and to a certain extent, maize as well. There are also other products, natural products, such as forage drape, uh, fodder beet, that's been shown to reduce um, methane production by about 20 to 30 percent. There are other products, uh, such as the red um, asparagus seaweed, that's shown a massive uh, decrease in, in methane production, of 80 percent. Um, so there, there are ways to, to, to do this. Now, the red asparagus, I don't think it's going to be commercially available for any, any time soon, but certainly by 2040, 2050, then there may well be a process commercially available to produce enough of the red asparagus seaweed or its 
main factors um, to be able to feed the cows to reduce methane. Over the last 20 years, we've got three NOP, again, which is um, designed to uh, reduce the effect of the methanogens and will reduce methane by about 30 percent. Um, other factors, uh, a vaccine. So the guys in, in New Zealand are working on a vaccine uh, to reduce the effect of the methanogens. Again, a 30 percent reduction is possible. But on the farm scale at the moment, I think it is really looking at better quality forages. Um, you know, to, to really drive drive the methane down alongside, but it, it, I think it's key to say that everything needs to be balanced. It, you know, the foragers on their own won't do it. It needs to be a totally balanced diet to really get the, the room and working properly. The, and I've the just put up a slide here with, um, sorry, over to you, David. Well, I was just going to say that the, the other part, so of all the, the methane that's generated on farm, about 14% of it comes solely from, from the storage and application of, of manures. Um, so I think, you know, of, of that 14%, 74% just comes from how, how we store the um, store manures. And if you think about um, biodigesters, everything you do to increase the methane is the opposite of what we want to that. It, 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 when we're just storing it to, to apply to land. So the cooler we can keep it, um, you know, below 10 degrees, you know, or 10 degrees compared to 17 degrees, will give a reduction of methane of around about sort of 50 to 60 percent. Lower uh, pH, pH has a big impact on, on the amount of um, not only methane, but also nitrous oxides that are generated. So slightly acidic um, slurry down to 6.5, 5.5 will reduce you know, up to sort of 50, 60 percent the amount of methane that, that's generated compared to sort of a se seven or eight pH um, slurry. Um, and also the, the agitation. So the more, more that's, that's being agitated, the more slurry it's going to get, uh, so more methane that is going to be produced. So from not only methane, but nitrous oxides and also ammonia, there is a very strong argument for uh, covering all slurry stores. Um, it's quite compelling. There's, there, there really isn't any downsides of covering the slurry stores, um, apart from the physical cost of it. Um, so that, you know, there, there's lots of ways there that we, if we wanted to achieve a 10% reduction in methane, um, I think we can go well beyond that. Um, on a farm level, on all farms, you know, in the very near near future, really. So, after methane, purchase feed is the largest contribution of carbon dioxide. Should we therefore be feeding less concentrate? This is um, uh, sort of an ongoing argument, I think. The Things has been been involved in looking at uh, feed efficiency for as long as it's been in existence, um, and we've this milk map will be familiar to lots of people. Um, and I think what is is amazing is we're still a very vast difference between people's ability to produce milk from forage. If on that graph in front of you, if you take the line from 8,000 liters, there there will be farms that are producing. Uh, 8,000 litres off of maybe 1.4 tonne of concentrates, or there'll be others that will be producing 8,000 litres at 3,000 tonne, or 3,000 kilos of concentrate. Um, so that the, there is that inherent variability at the moment. So anything that can be done to reduce that variability and basically move, us, move the efficiency uh, towards the left um, has can have a marked difference on the amount of, of your carbon footprint. And again, key to all this, there's a common theme that comes, comes through, I think, with all of these arguments for, re, for reducing greenhouse gases. One of the key things to reduce yes. your um, feed efficiency is to improve your forage quality. And again, clovers come into that, um, you know, the higher digestibilities, um, younger forages reduce both greenhouse gas, uh, methane, and, and also improve um, 
the carbon dioxide from that's embedded in in um, in feed because you're using less concentrates. I think the the other big argument here is if we're measuring um, if, if there is a carbon trading scheme that's generated, then where do the byproducts sit? You know, ruminants are very good at um, using byproducts. And um, they can, you know, which would otherwise have to be, you know, if there was a carbon trading scheme, there's a certain amount of carbon that's locked up in those byproducts um, that would need to either be decomposted and put onto, onto land, which would uh, be a cost to the um, producer, or it can be fed to, to livestock. And it, see, I think there's an interesting argument is, is whether there will be carbon, carbon credits in that situation. It, but it certainly makes sense that if you're going to use concentrates, using byproducts of it as a concentrate um, makes a lot of sense. And it's already happening. So that, I think, you know, it would be a, um, a big step. I think that's um, the, the, the sort of key points, I think, with reducing your feed intake. Oh, this other <laughs> obvious, the other obvious one is just by using sustainable sources of soya and palm. Uh, palm kernel or alternatives um, that do not um, necessitate the, the burning of any rainforest is a quick easy way um, and I think that, that's been available now for um, a few years sustainable sources. Thank you there, David. Sorry, my connection's been going in and out, so I hope I haven't been interrupting you. So within no. the industry, when discussing greenhouse gases, I've lost you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, can you go to the next slide? There's been much discussion around all sorts of nitrogen. Um, sorry, Sarah, I didn't um, pick up the question there. Um, so I'll just go through uh, th this slide. So nitrous oxides uh, are clearly the, the other big part of um, greenhouse gases is over, uh, over the whole country, it represents only about 4% of total greenhouse gases, but of that 4%, 50% is solely generated from um, agriculture. Again, there's a big chunk of 30%, 31% that's coming from the embedded fertilizer, so through the production of, of nitrogen in particular, that is reducing or, the, or creating the nitrous oxide. So, you know, one clear clear off um, opportunity is to buy from manufacturers that are using scrubbers and other methods to to reduce the uh, embedded carbon dioxide in in their products. Of the other two, you know, the two, the twenty six percent and the twenty three percent, twenty six percent of nitrous oxides is from leaching, and that's nitrogen will leach from the soil as nitrates, but once it gets in the water. It, it then uh, gets converted to nitrous oxides very often. And so that still represents a big chunk of nitrous oxides. The 23% um, is, is pretty much to do with the application of slurries and fertilizer and the type of fertilizer, whether it's urea or ammonia nitrate and the, and the, um, and the timing and the environmental conditions that those are in, applied in. Um, I don't want to say really too too much about all the different application methods. I think yeah that that's been well well documented, um, uh, and also with the the use of urea versus ammonia nitrate. But I think one of the key things that, that I do see that that is needed, uh, and, and and certainly somewhere like Ag Agriepi could be uh, instrumental in this, is that there's a it would be relatively easy now to model with all the, the sensors in the soil, soil moisture, nutrients, soil nutrients, um, weather conditions, uh, a whole vast factor that becomes much more proactive at predicting, right, this crop needs so much amount of nitrogen. The, we, we talked about acidifying the slurry earlier, and I think again, increasing the, um, the availability of nitrogen through acidification um, and 
and things like that. But the, the other big factor that we're going to be coming on to in a moment when we're looking at carbon sequestration is the effect of the soil. And I think you know, too, too little has been played um, over a long period of time on, the, on healthy soils. As we, as we improve soil and so water retention in soils, the movement of water up and down through the profile um, will just allow uh, more of that nitrogen to be caught, particularly if it's, it's either inhibited or has some, some effects um, or put on at exactly the right time and the right amount at the right time uh, for those, the, the prevailing weather conditions. I just also want to pick up in the time we've got available this 12% that's um, of nitrous oxide that's created by grazing animals, and, and that's certainly the case. <clears throat> um, grazing animals will, will you know, through the urine, uh, produce a lot of nit uh, nitrous oxides. There are two things to this. I think one is, uh, we've mentioned a little bit on feed efficiency. Uh, one of the key things I think that's happening, uh, been happening over the last five to 10 years, is the improvement of uh, protein uh, efficiency in cows. So 75% of all nitrogen that a cow eats is, is lost. Um, and I think as, as we, we become better and better at um, reducing protein or increasing the protein efficiency, uh, then this level will naturally fall. The other big part I want to make is that if you compare the alternative, and it is, it, you're then balancing the alternative to nitrous oxides that are being generated at pasture, alternatively, cows inside that um, urinating onto concrete, which are creating ammonia, or it's being, you're going to have to store that slurry in warmer conditions, which is creating more methane. So I think there is a trade off between nitrous oxide in grazing animals or methane and ammonia from animals in, inside the building. Um, so I, th I think yeah, th th there is a trade off. Covering the store will reduce uh, quite a bit of that nitrous oxide. So you can cut the, the 8% down to 4% relatively straightforward by other measures to um, prevent methane. Um, are you there, Sarah? Or have we lost you completely? Oh, there we are. So David, we've, we've heard, yeah, so David, we've heard there of all that. Again, I'm struggling. The I'm sources struggling is right. part of the solution. Over to you, David. Uh, thank Can you, Sarah. you tell us about carbon sequestration? Yeah, I, I, I miss half the questions, but I can go through. Um, I think one of the big one of the big factors that that agriculture uh, can provide for the whole country, really, is, is the, this or the whole world, really, is storing carbon. We all know that carbon has been been lost from our soils over the last sort of 50 to 70 years. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of well known. Um, and really, just to put some, give some sort of figures to that. So, if you take a typical bulk soil of 1.3 grams cubic meter, that can contain something like about 146 kilos, no, sorry, tons of carbon carbon dioxide equivalents. So carbon is about 39 tonnes, carbon dioxide is about 146 tonnes. So the, we, we have this um, uh, policy now of being developed of increasing carbon by 0.4%. Um, and that, and if you can do that on a year on year basis, it will capture around about one and a half tonne of carbon per hectare. Now, clearly, that you can't do that forever and ever, but it will certainly you can certainly do it from from our starting point to to where we get to a saturation point, and and each soil will be slightly different on this over about a twenty to forty year period. So at least it gives a, um, a transition period to move from a, a carbon economy through to a non-carbon um, economy, and and it can be done relatively straightforward. Oh, we're moving on. I think I must be running so out David, of time. We're running out of, we're running out of time. So if we could just move on to the summary, there, okay. David. So I think what you know, in summary, 
I think there's a big question about how we measure carbon dioxide. Should we be doing it per hectare? If we're using carbon sequestration as a mitigation measure, measure, then it makes sense to measure carbon per hectare. This way, I think, particularly in agriculture, you can compare um, either cattle to wheat or barley or, or any other crop. Um, I think there's a, um, a question around that is, is whether we should be measuring carbon uh, equivalents per hectare. If we do that, then what does the, what does the carbon neutral farm look like? You know, I, my feeling is it's going to be based on longer term high yielding forages and legume crops. I think it's more focused on feed efficiency and concentrates that are based more on byproducts. A lot more focus on slurry storage and spreading acidification. Um, and increased modeling um, with proactive recommendations of the type and timing of, of, of applications. I think carbon trading is probably essential um, to be able to allow these things to happen, uh, particularly in, in soil, soil enhancement of um, those carbon storage. Without a trading scheme, it's, it's very difficult to see how that, how that can work. Energy generation and energy saving, I think that, that continues to go on. And, and there's a big argument, I think, for rewilding of those unproductive areas um, that, that helped, again, capture more of the, of the carbon within, within the system. So I think that just about finishes my time up. Brilliant. Thank you, David and Sarah, for that. So now we are going to hand over to Jan van Dijk, veterinary consultant of ruminants at Zoetis. So Jan is the UK technical lead for Smartbow within Zoetis and has had an extensive career in veterinary. So since becoming a doctor of veterinary medicine from Utrecht University, Jan spent five years in mixed and ruminant veterinary practice as well as working in livestock disease surveillance for APHA and DEFRA. So he spent eight years working as a lecturer in ruminant health at the University of Liverpool and almost two years working as an epidemiologist and data analyst for the Animal Health Trust. Jan has now been with Zoetis for a year and a half as a technical consultant and we can see your screen Jan, so off you go. Thank you very much. So uh, we heard from David and, and, and we he told us that a lot of the methane is actually produced by the cows themselves. So uh, in the next 15 minutes, I want to think about animal health and, and fertility and uh, think about how improving both will actually make a difference on the carbon footprint of the farm. Um, and I want to use the example of Smartbow, which is a, a, a little tag that sits on the top of the ear of a cow. Uh, that continuously measures what the cow is doing in terms of activity, whether she's ruminating, and it continuously sends the information to your mobile phone. And if there's something wrong with that cow, you get an alert immediately and you can act upon that. So this is all very much part of uh, the movement of pre precision livestock farming, um, which tries to optimize the contribution that the individual animal makes to the herd. And that, that's part of a new trend, really. Uh, so in the olden days, as a vet, you would uh, sit in the office. Uh, and when a cow got sick, a farmer would phone you. And then you would go out and treat that animal. Then, then farmer and vet start to work more together and adopt a, uh, a whole herd approach. Uh, start to say, well, we need to monitor what the herd is doing uh, in terms of disease, production levels, etc. So vets became involved in that. But the, the movement is now really gone back towards the individual animal to measuring everything there is to measure about the individual animal. And as part of that, we will create loads of data, of course, and that will uh, be back at, at the herd level as well. So in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of animals on a farm, if we concentrate on health, uh, what can we do? Well, I think a, a key thing is now to start breeding animals that can actually cope with the system. Yeah, we have a product for within Zoetis, uh, the company that I work for called, called Clarified Plus, and we can now use uh, cow genomics to really breed that animal that can not only produce, but it can also produce a, a calf a year, so it's highly fertile, 
and an animal that also doesn't become ill. So we have those tools now. And that also means that we can sift out the bad from the good. So we can, when a calf is born, we can do a test and we can find out whether that animal is going to be efficient on that farm. And we can get, you know, let's say we can get rid of 20 heifers that are not going to be efficient on that farm. Uh, at the very early stage, that's going to have a massive uh, impact on the carbon footprint of that farm. Now, second, uh, we have to prevent disease. Uh, a, a sick animal is not an efficient one, of course. So we need to focus on vaccines and teeth sealant, etc. Uh, the third thing we need to do is to uh, improve our diagnostics so that we actually can know what, what the animal is doing and uh, start to realize that we can measure when animals start to go off the rails and when we need to do something. And the last thing is then to, to monitor animals 24 seven along certain timelines and so that we know exactly at all times what the animal's doing. And this is why a company like Soetis, an animal health company, uh, is actually moving dramatically what it, what, from what it's been doing traditionally, is mainly producing treatments towards uh, producing more and more vaccines to prevent disease. Uh, now getting into the space of detecting disease uh, and SmartBo is an, an example of that. But taking it even one step further, as I said, uh, by re-predicting disease at the very early stage. So is an animal going to be sick? Yes or no? We can, we can predict it now when the animal is born. So, I mentioned SmartBo. What is it exactly? So it is an ear tag system uh, that continuously measures what the uh, what the animal is doing. So every four to ten seconds, it sends a signal to a sensor, and that uh, signal goes back to the computer and, and gets analyzed. Um, we use intelligent algorithms, uh, and that means that it, the system really gets to know the individual cow. Yeah, so it, it follows an animal over time. The tag is put in, and the longer the tag stays in the cow, the uh, the better it gets to know the individual animal, and therefore it detects the earliest opportunity when animal is uh, getting sick, for example, or when an animal is getting heat is uh, as a heat. Um, if something's up with an animal, it sends the alert to your to your smartphone, and one key thing about SmartBo is that it has unrivaled accuracy. So, so we, the systems are now so good that they can predict with close to 100% accuracy really whether the animal is in the heat, for example, or whether the cow is ruminating. So I want to uh, look at, at four efficiencies that this uh, such a system can bring. Uh, so if we improve heat detection rates, and if we improve conception rates on the farm, and if we pick up health events or, or threats to health at the earliest opportunity, then one thing that's going to do is that we're going to decrease our uh, replacement rates, um, and we're going to have fewer days open. Yeah, if we detect uh, three heat detection and improving the conception. So less wastage on the farm. Now, quite uniquely, our, our uh, sensor can actually tell you exactly where the animals are. And I would like to show you how that links in with the efficiency. Uh, crucially, you know, I could get loads of alerts to my farm, uh, to my phone uh, every day, uh, but I need to be able to act upon them. So if I get an alert, I'm able to walk up to the animal there and then. And, and check her over, I'm quite likely to go into on the alerts. If I can't find that cow anywhere, uh, I'm not going to act upon. And the last uh, not so obvious thing to talk about is, is battery life, because I think that makes a key difference. Uh, um, yeah, in terms of long-term costs of the system, uh, but also maybe on carbon footprint. So I already said our, uh, our system is near 100% accurate. So uh, for heat detection, it is 97% uh, accurate. So we published work on that. And that, that means that we can now pick up 
97 out of 100 heats that occur on the farm. And it also means that when you get an alert on your phone to tell you that the cow is in heat, you can be 97% sure that there is actually a true heat. Yeah, and that's that's a real benefit, of course, because again, then for a straw, walk up to the cow and inseminate her uh, before, uh, without checking her over before uh, first. So how can it be so accurate? Well, part of that is uh, was by the fact that we we, we take so many many measurements a day. Yeah, as you all know, uh, it can be really hard to determine whether a cow is in heat. Uh, so this is a cow that's not in heat. Uh, it's it's has spells of inactivity and and laying down and ruminating, uh, followed by red spells of uh, of high activity. Now you would expect probably a cow that's in heat to have these red spells of of uh, lots of activity all the time, but but it hasn't. The cow increases her activity, but the pattern of activity becomes very very different. Now, if you take lots of measurements and you get to know this cow individually, then uh, you can uh, pick up diversions of what's normal uh, at the early stage. So I say heat detection is uh, levels are very high. And uh, you can say, well, how does that matter? What, when, what's it got to do with carbon footprint? So in the previous live, indeed, there was a, a little bit of mathematical modeling for my sense. Uh, so I, I thought I, I'm going to calculate the difference in terms of days open for a 200 cow herd uh, for our system with a very high sensitivity and for another uh, system with uh, about 10% less sensitivity. Um, so in 45 days, the cows are uh, in voluntary waiting period, and, and then they start to get in calf. And you could say, well, the difference between the lines is not actually that great, but it actually uh, comes to 1,400 days open. And that's uh, so the, the days really that uh, uh, the cows should be in calf, but are not yet. So they uh, relate to wastage. But also crucially, uh, depending on when you would stop serving these cows, yeah, so normally uh, day 150 to 180, the farm starts to think, well, this cow is never going to get in calf. Uh, she may be sent on to the abattoir at some point. Uh, a more sensitive system gets more cows in calf. Yeah, so, so we will be saving, the, let's say, the lives of uh, potentially about 10 cows. And, and so there's 10 cows being able to stay on the farm rather than being sent to the abattoir and being replaced. That in turn has a massive effect again on the, the carbon footprint of the farm, obviously. Uh, I said the system is also improving conception rates. So how does it do that? Well, it, it tracks the individual animal over time. And then it comes to a spell of increased activity that's given by the blue line. And then the system started to look back and say, did the cow do something similar roughly 21 days ago, which is when it was last in heat? Yeah, and, and 24, 21 days before that, et cetera, et cetera. And was a pattern of activity during that last heat similar to what she's doing now? Uh, if so, then yes, uh, she's very likely to be in heat. So I get a, a pro yellow probability line for the cow actually being in heat. And by tracking that in time, we can also determine the moment when the animal is no longer in heat. And from that moment, we can calculate the optimum time to inseminate the cow. Yeah, so not only does it tell you that the cow is in heat, but also exactly when to inseminate the cow. And if you get that right, then uh, that will uh, improve your conception rates uh, considerably. Now, we also monitor the rumination. What are the benefits of that? Um, crucially, early detection of disease. So a cow stops ruminating, there's something wrong with that animal. And uh, it might not be serious, but she needs to be checked over. Um, 
I can look at changes in the ration. I can also follow the rumination data for uh, for a group of animals and uh, and what is the effect that the change in the ration might make. Now, of course, various industries is, is high pressure to increase the well-being, uh, welfare of the cows, and this is a, a very good measure of that welfare. Of course. Um, also, when you treat animals sooner, before they get really sick, you end up using less antibiotics. So does that actually uh, work? Well, here's some data on the, in the graph on the left uh, that shows the, the minutes of rumination of a cow, of cows that got sick on day, day zero. So at day zero, uh, we're determined to have clinical mastitis, E. coli mastitis in this case. Yeah, and that the black line is that rumination data on cows that did not get sick, and the white dotted lines represent data on cows that did get E. coli mastitis. And what we see is that the rumination actually starts to decline two, one to two days before the cow actually gets sick. Yeah, so if this cow is already suspect, we, uh, shortly after milking, for example, and because of rumination, we can now check her over and treat her immediately, and and which will mean that she will not get sick in the first place. So does it actually work? Well, here's some data on the right on on a large uh, collected on a large German farm where we installed SmartBow. Yeah, we installed SmartBow at the end of January, um, and the month leading up to that, they had 38 cases of acute mastitis and 11 uh, subclinical cases of mastitis, so where they, the case got picked up early. And after a couple of months of uh, using SmartBow, the, the number of subclinical cases that was picked up uh, in, increased dramatically to, to 59, and they only had one acute case in June. Yeah, so just an illustration of uh, how this really helps in terms of cows never reaching the state of getting very sick. Then I mentioned the, the localization. So, um, yeah, what benefits does that bring? Well, of course, if I've got uh, three, four hundred cows running around in a barn and I get an alert, uh, preferably I would want to be able to walk up to the cubicle where she is and uh, give her a quick check over. Some people even serve cows in, in cubicles. Uh, you can debate whether that's uh, desirable or not, but it's, it's done. Uh, fairly routinely. Now with the localization feature, we can indeed walk up to the cubal and, and find a cow. Um, and that will save valuable time. Yeah, we can put a numeric value on that. But crucially, if I'm able to walk up to that cow, I'm quite likely to do something with the alert. And again, if I don't act on the alert, then uh, you might as well not have a whole system installed in the first place. So many farmers will tell you that um, they were able to find a cow within the system anyway. Yeah, so, so yesterday I looked at the data uh, of cows, I picked a random cow, 601, uh, running around at King's Hay. And uh, at the time when I logged in, I saw that she had just uh, left the area where she, the, the milking area. Yeah, she was quite likely heading for the for the food trough. Uh, so that's where she was at that moment in time. Uh, so a lot of farmers will tell you, well, I know where my cows are. And of course, in systems where ro robots are used, uh, that's far less the case, because you, you don't know where the cows are at any moment in time within the system. But in the, the 72 hours leading up to that moment, uh, this is where the cow had been. So lots of time in the food trough, but visited various cubicles. And she'd also spend time at pasture. Yeah, so is, how easy is it to, uh, to find a cow? I would argue uh, not so easy as you think. What we can also do with, uh, with this is uh, divide the farm up into certain areas. So like the, the milking area, the feed space, the cubicle space, and start to analyze uh, how much time is the cow spending in each area. And we can oh, yeah. make... I'm going to give you one yeah. more minute to finish up there because we're running out of time. Yeah. But 
Okay, I'm uh, only done anyway. Um, so I can look at where the cow is spending time, and this cow, for example, on this day, spent an excessive amount of time uh, in the milking area. So if, if that were to happen uh, regularly, I, I may have to change. Uh, I may have to change the groups, for example. She may be scared for certain cows that are uh, being milked and. Uh, and spend a lot of time in the milking area because of that being battery life. So I won't uh, I won't dwell on it, but uh, the, the batteries are uh, fully replaceable. Um, so they, they run out every two, three years, but you can just replace a tiny battery and then the system goes again. That makes it far more uh, far cheaper than a lot of systems that, that may have uh, lower startup costs, but uh, will have to be replaced after a couple of years. And if you think of the carbon footprint, for example, of uh, yeah, throwing $300 away uh, after a couple of years and then buying a whole new system, um, I would argue that that's important. Um, last, um, we had SmartBow installed at uh, uh, SWDDC. Uh, things hey and um, yeah we found just, just from speaking to the, the people working on the farm uh, that it has saved the lives of cows that uh, were going down with uh, would otherwise have gone down with the E. coli mastitis for example um, Stockman said that uh, particularly in when it comes to displaced abomasum that uh, uh, cows were picked up a lot sooner treated sooner and that the uh, success rate of treatments was, was way, way higher. And crucially that the, uh, the conception rates uh, went up dramatically. And they were good already, but they uh, improved. Um, yeah, so from our experience, Kings Hay is, is a great research facility and anyone uh, considering whether they would like to use it to do research or collaborative uh, work, I would greatly recommend it. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry if I've gone one minute over, or even more than that. Uh, There's my email address for any questions. I would uh, very much welcome you to welcome it if you uh, were to send any questions for further information. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Jan. No, a great deep dive there into looking at how we can use technology to more closely monitor our animals. And, you know, we really, you know, continue to enjoy the AgriFP Kings Hay and Zoetis collaboration down at the Southwest Dairy Development Centre. So speaking of the Development Centre, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Duncan Forbes, Head of Dairy for AgriFP Centre. So Duncan has a wealth of experience in the dairy industry. Um, after several, several years in practical farming, Duncan moved into farm management consultancy, worked for over 20 years as the managing director at Kings Hay. In his current role at Agri Epicentre in Somerset, he is focused on the development of the dairy research and demonstration facility, for 180 cows combining robotic milking and feeding in our state-of-the-art building with precision grazing, which you're just about to hear more about now. So we can see your screen, Duncan, it's over to you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Cassie, uh, very interesting. We are running a little bit uh, over here, but we'll just see what we can do. So what I'd like to just talk to you about is what we're calling future dairy. What does the future of milk production look like? And the Southwest Dairy Development Centre has been developed to try and provide a vision for the future of milk uh, production. There's some key uh, organisations involved. So the funding for it came through Bayers uh, via Innovate UK uh, to the Agri Epicentre. And we're very much uh, working with Kingshay, for whom I've worked for 25 years. So I know many of the colleagues on the call today. Um, and David Pettit and I work very closely on the development of this of this dairy and uniquely it's actually on private land so steamboat farms that christensen family uh, have made over the land to us for this uh, facility which i think uh, is uh, pretty much unique um that sort of arrangement so uh just persuade this thing to go forward <clears throat> um so we saw the map before um so the agri epicenter has uh three um, major investments in dairy facilities. The one I'm going to be speaking to you down in the, here in the Southwest um, 
the dairy unit at Harper Adams and the calf rearing facility uh, with SRUC in Dumfries. And then some of the satellite farms that Cassie mentioned are dairy units as well. So when it comes to the Southwest Dairy Development Center, we're just south of Shepton Mallet. Um, the, the building is built for 180 cows. Um, uh, and the reason it's here in the Southwest, it's a major milk producing region. Um, and the the facility, the building itself is is the first of its kind in the UK. It's a company called ID Agro from the Netherlands that provided the uh, fabric roofed building that you can see here. This is in the build stage. Uh, it's a, a 90 meters long, 28 wide. Uh, and then with the uh, feed kitchen there, just by the white van, the extra bit of building sticking out there. So here you can see it in the landscape because what we're aiming to do is harness the power of robotics, automation and sensor technology, combining that with state-of-the-art housing and importantly, precision grazing to optimize cow welfare and productivity. The roof itself is interesting in that that entire roof material weighs three and a half tons and were that to be a conventional roof, it'd be well over 50 tons and require a great deal more steel to hold it up. As you look at the size of the steel uprights in the right hand picture. Um, and it's also translucent, which means it tran uh, transmits a lot of light, natural light into the building and you get really nice light uh, levels across the building. Um, the layout inside, uh, you saw in uh, Jan's um, uh, presentation. So what you've got is the cubicle area and the, the black arrows show the movement of the cows. It's, it's a uh, control system. The cows go from there into a race which either uh, sheds them into the milking area or the, the uh, race carries on around the side of the building and along the lower side there where that red arrow is flashing is where that cow in the in the movie has just come out into the feed area that you can see and you can see the light coming through the through the roof there uh, but also that race can take the cow straight on out all the way out to uh, grazing the um <clears throat> The the milking robots, um, there's three of them. They're GEO monobox uh, robots, um, and they, are like uh, most uh, uh, robot systems, provide a very good level of data, which is important for research purposes, and, and also very low levels of cow stress, in that the cows are able to choose to get themselves milk when they want to. Um, and uh, with this control system, you can see the cow that left the robot is entering the race to leave. Another cow has just gone into that robot. And as the cow leaving goes, the transponder is red and the gate is switched and off she goes down around the race um, to, the, uh, to the feed area. And on the right hand side, it, the, the video there is showing that with this particular make of robot, the, there's, it's a single attachment achieves everything. So the First thing that it does uh, when the cluster is attached is uh, clean the teats, um, then uh, stimulates milk let down, pre milks it, all of that goes to the waste channel. The uh, cow is then milked uh, and the clusters come off individually as each uh, quarter milks out. Uh, and, and in the process, you get a lot of information uh, about each quarter. Um, <clears throat> so the, the the automation goes on to the uh, feed system as well so instead of having a tractor and mixer wagon we have this automated uh, feed system coming in overhead on a rail which runs all the way down the building um, so this comes from the feed kitchen where the um, the the mix is formulated and um, and uh, goes into the mixer feeder which then travels up the building and delivers it to the feed trough that it's been programmed to deliver to. The beauty of this being that uh, we can feed a large number of cows or you can send it out to feed a single cow. Uh, so even when you've got a cow in the transition area, it doesn't then get a sudden change of diet just at the crucial point when it needs to stay the same. Um, so the nice thing about it is instead of feeding cows maybe once or twice a day, um, most winters we're running this out to feed the milking cows as many as 20 times a day so uh, smaller quantities more frequently just on the right hand side another bit of uh, sensor technology the feed bins are sitting on way cells 
so that we know exactly how much feed is uh, left in the bin. And that same data goes back to the feed mill, which enables them to optimize their sort of supply logistics and thereby reduce the carbon footprint of their deliveries. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the control of the ventilation is also automated. So uh, the entire one side of the building has a gale breaker curtain, which is controlled by a wind speed anemometer and wind direction sensor and a rain sensor and also temperature sensors inside the building. So all of those or any one of those four can dictate the positioning of the curtain to optimize the ventilation inside the building. It's five meters to the eave, so you get very good ventilation across the building um, and, uh, and it's working extremely well. Now we've talked about cow activity. Um, the, the cows uh, at the unit have more than you would necessarily have uh, commercially. So there's quite a bit of overlapping data, but also complementary. So uh, we've heard from Jan about the smart bow uh, tags that we have. And in the uh, top right hand picture, you can just see the sensor uh, above the yellow ear tag inside the cow's ear. Then on the collar, uh, you can see a little blue one down below the, below the 502, that's the GEA transponder, which is the one that's controlling the robots and the shedding gates and measuring activity as well. And then the AffiMilk silent herdsman sensor uh, on the collar above the five there. Um, as well as those, the picture in the middle shows a cow with the uh, ankle strap of the uh, Ice Robotics Cow Alert System. Um, uh, and, and indeed, there we are again, the, the smart bow system uh, readout there of one cow's activity. So that it is very useful for the farm staff when they want to find a cow uh, to just look on the smart bow system and find out where she is. Um, so as far as the slurry uh, uh, removal from the building is concerned, what we have is a slatted channel down the middle of every uh, passageway and then a robotic uh, scraping system that scrapes the slurry across to that slatted channel. So rather than having a fully slatted floor with the storage underneath the building, we just have channels uh, to which the slurry is scraped across by this uh, robot scraper. Um, and then it moves passively out of the building to a chamber. And in the top right hand picture, uh, it goes, it is pumped from the building that you can see in the middle of the picture down to the slurry store uh, which is there in the lower picture. So that at the moment is, um, as far as we've got it, we've got raw slurry uh, in the store. So there's huge opportunities for us to uh, do more in the way of research, uh, dealing uh, and indeed optimizing the, the value of the slurry uh, from, from, the, from the dairy. I mentioned precision grazing and um, the, um, the cows go out of the building, which you can see on the map there to the left hand side. Uh, and uh, through a, a grazing gate system, they're then directed uh, along one of the cow tracks. That you can see they're marked on the map. Uh, they will be uh, uh, directed to an allocated, precisely measured area of grazing. Uh, and we've been operating a system with uh, multiple paddocks, so six hour paddocks, so four. Uh, fresh grazings every uh, 24 hours um, and, and um, there's a lot to do to combine the automated milking system with grazing successfully and that's what this is about and there's a very good reason for that um, which is not only is there market demand for cows to be seen out uh, at grazing but there's a very good economic reason um, which is uh, uh, shown many times by the Kingsay Forage Costings report that graze grass is a long way the cheapest source of milk, at roughly three pence to get you a litre of milk. So if you take account of all the costs of growing the grass, the cows are doing the harvesting, there's no storage involved. As soon as you make it into silage, it's more than double that cost. You've obviously got to make silage, but nevertheless, you want to be optimizing the amount of milk you get from grazing. Um, so optimizing grazing utilization is therefore an important part of what we're trying to achieve and um, we certainly use a plate meter as you can see on the left hand side to, to measure how much grass we have uh, across the farm across the grazing platform 
uh, and we do that uh, every week. Um, it's quite a time consuming process. Um, and um, what we've been involved in is uh, a project called 5G Rural First, the use of 5G for improving connectivity and data transmission uh, in rural areas. And the Southwest area was one of the test beds for this particular project. And one of the use cases within it was using a 5G connected drone with a multispectral camera on it to scan the grassland and then transmit the data direct from the drone to 5G. Um, and then on the right hand side, we're talking about soil health. David was mentioning that. And we are installing a good number of sensors across the farm to inform us in what's going on. And, and this one is a, a soil moisture sensor. And uh, the readout there shows you that we were getting very short of, of moisture in the soil on the left hand side of the graphs. Uh, and the grass growth had fallen to 10 kilos of dry matter a day. And then we had that heavy downfall. And you can see how that's penetrated down the depth of the uh, of the of the uh, soil profile. So there's been quite a number of projects going on. Uh, 5G Rural First I mentioned, new one just starting 5G New Thinking. So again, uh, working with the 5G um, uh, connectivity. Smart View is the uh, uh, um, augmented reality tool that we're uh, uh, in a project there. Uh, with Kings Hayes uh, owning organization, Bet Partners as one of the partners in that. Uh, animal behavior analytics is going to be using uh, video cameras to uh, track uh, animal health. Um, LoRaWAN is a low uh, power connectivity across the farm. So there's more opportunity to, to use um, uh, sensors and so on uh, across the farm and so on. And there's a lot of others coming through. And so just to, uh, to, to, to uh, start to close down, the, just to be aware, those of you listening, that um, obviously we've not been able to uh, have visitors in the last uh, few months, but we do have very good visitor facilities there. And uh, up till now, we've had over 2000 people in the two years we've been open have come through this facility. And as you can see, it's got a meeting space uh, with views out to the uh, beautiful Somerset countryside. But probably more beautiful to those of us on the call is the internal view you can see uh, of the cows and what's going on there. Um, a really important role for AgriEpis too is, is engage with industry uh, and relink uh, industry with research. And these are some of the key uh, industry partners we have at the Southwest Dairy. The top five there um, are uh, particularly important in that they are sponsors who help to fund the, the costs of the visitor center because we focus the grant money on the cows. Um, so the dairy farm fit for the future. There's huge opportunities and challenges. The technological innovation is accelerating and growing at a huge rate. And the challenge for producers is choosing which is the right tech for their business to optimize animal welfare and productivity. Then the challenge for innovators is to make sure that the data from their technology integrates with others. Uh, as farmers, we don't want to have to open seven different um, screens in order to then make up our minds. We need it all integrated together. Um, and, and importantly, what we need to be able to do to come back to much as what David was talking about, we need to be able to produce more with less impact. That's the key challenge, the drive towards zero carbon. Uh, the closed loop dairying concept. And that is very much something we want to be driving to achieve uh, at the Southwest Dairy. So that the dairy farm of the future is an exciting place for future generations uh, in a world of ever increasing choice. We need to retain the, the skills we already have in the industry and attract uh, new blood as well. So just to wrap up, we certainly think that agri-tech is absolutely key to business resilience to, to be able to produce more with less. And, and it is a virtuous circle all the way from understanding and generating healthy soils to generate healthy crops, healthy livestock, which produce healthy food, and thereby most importantly, uh, for sustainability of businesses, healthy profits. And with that, Cassie, I'll close. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Duncan. I'm just gonna turn my camera back on there. 
So we've run a little bit over uh, schedule, which always happens when we've got interesting speakers. You know, we don't want to slow anybody down. We don't want to stop anyone. So we really hope that you didn't mind. That does mean that we aren't going to be able to take questions as planned at the end of the webinar, but we have recorded all your questions. We do have everybody's email addresses from when you signed up, so we will make sure that we get back to you with them. So with that, we'd just like to thank you all for attending the webinar. It's been fantastic to host you all. We hope this session's been useful. Um, like I said, we'll be in touch to answer your questions directly. Um, you'll also receive a recording of the webinar. Um, please join us uh, next Thursday and the following Thursday for our two next webinars. So the next one is on cow behaviour and welfare with Harp Evans University. And the third is on calf health and nutrition with SRUC. So we wish you a safe rest of the day and please remember to join us for the next two weeks. Thank you to all the speakers and that's us done.